whenever I get my hair cut, I always end up talking about Christianity. <laughs> it's funny how it happens because they're, they're cutting my hair and then the first question is always, oh, how is your day? And it's like, oh, it's good. And then a little bit of time passes and then I always get asked, so what do you do? And for the past four years, my answer has been, oh, I'm a college student. And then everybody knows the obligatory follow-up question to hearing, oh, you're a college student. You ask, what are you studying? Yes. And so every time I would get asked that, and it became so frequent in my haircuts, I, I wanted to start saying a major that was a lot more impressive than just theology, which is what my major was. And so I, was, I, I really wanted to be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm majoring in medical and biological informatics, or, um, you know, I'm majoring in energetic materials, you know, like, <laughs> I realized, though, if I were to lie and say that, then they would ask me follow-up questions that I would have absolutely no answer for. <laughs> and so I just, just because I would only be able to answer more questions about theology, and not at all because lying is immoral or anything, I just decided to say I was majoring in theology. So that ended up causing a conversation about Christianity nearly every time I got a haircut. And it would cause usually one of three responses with the hairstylist. The first of which would be that the hairstylist shared my faith and we struck up a great conversation about Christianity and uh, our experience with it as uh, we've lived our life. The second one is probably the most funny to me, which is they're cutting my hair and they go, oh, that's cool. And then they change the subject in a manner more dramatic or, and quick than I have ever seen before. And it's just, boom, we're onto a different subject. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm studying. Okay. And the third, which is probably the most rare, but also the most interesting, is if they don't share my faith and they'll ask me follow-up questions about Christianity. Now, Sometimes, very rarely, I will get somebody who is genuinely curious about my faith, and they'll ask me a question because they want to know something about my faith. But sadly, more often than not, in that third category, I will get somebody who just wants to ask me a question that is a trap, and they want me to say something that only a Christian would say. And even more crucially, that response has then put me in a box to them. I am in this Christian box. And luckily for me, I'm just a random guy and it's okay. I, 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 it doesn't really bother me that I'm just viewed like that and sometimes, but it's a little bit different when we read about Jesus. In this reading, we encounter the same situation where the Pharisees are approaching Jesus and he has just told a parable and it says that the Pharisees were in no way interested in asking a genuine question. They didn't want to ask a question because they needed an answer. They wanted a question because they wanted to put Jesus in a box. They just wanted to frame him. And Jesus saw this. And it was such a bogus question, in fact, that the Pharisees weren't even willing to ask it themselves. The text says that they got their own disciples and some Herodians to ask the question for them. And of course they ask this question and Jesus sees right through it. And he says, I see what you're doing, <laughs> you hypocrites. Why are you trying to put me in a box? Why are you asking me this? And as sinners, we love doing the same thing. We love boxes. We love looking at people, sometimes our even fellow Christians, and we love putting them in a box and somehow kind of trying to apply our faith to that box. You know, maybe we, we look at somebody who's struggling with an addiction and it immediately becomes that box that they're in. We look at them and we say, oh, how could a Christian continue to fall into that sinful and harmful action? How is that a follower of Christ if they keep sinning that same thing over and over again? That's not very Christian. And then that box of addiction is all that defines them. Or maybe I've heard this one a lot. You, you, are someone who prefers traditional worship. You've grown up with the organ in your church your whole life, but then you meet somebody who hasn't grown up with the organ and they prefer contemporary worship. And they prefer, instead of an organist, maybe they prefer electric guitars and a drum kit and singers with microphones. And you look at that and you say, that's not real worship. That contemporary worship is the box that surrounds them now. And 
you say, that can't be real worship. Have you heard the lyrics of Hillsong music and all of this contemporary stuff? It's not real. It's not real worship. It's that box that surrounds them. Or maybe perhaps most applicable to this text is you overhear a family member or a friend talk about their political beliefs. And then that becomes the box that surrounds them. And you think, how could you be a Christian and support that cause, that public policy, or that politician? How could your political beliefs like that cause you to be a Christian? Those aren't Christian political beliefs. And then you put them in that box. And that box is what surrounds them. The Pharisees were trying to do this to Jesus. And to understand why they were so angry at Jesus and why they wanted to frame him like this, it's important to understand what the Israelite view of the Savior was going to be. So when Adam and Eve fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, God made a covenant with his people. He made a promise to them saying, I'm going to save you. I'm going to make this right. I know you messed up, but I'm going to send somebody who is going to fix this. And that covenant has lasted, and Jesus was the fulfillment of that covenant, as it is taught in the scriptures. But according to the Jews at the time and the Pharisees, and to this day, the Jewish religion still believes this, that the fulfillment of that covenant has not yet come, because they believe that the person who will come to redeem them is going to be a great military leader, who's going to conquer kingdoms and be super powerful and bring great prosperity and wealth to God's people, Israel. And it makes sense because so many of these messianic promises we find in places like Psalms or, you know, in the Pentateuch, it's predictions that are like King David. It's going to be the savior who is compared to King David, who is one of the most amazing, powerful kings for Israel. So it makes sense that they would expect some powerful military leader. But when Jesus comes along, he's this guy who hangs out with the, with the chief priests and the religious leaders, and he's not a powerful military leader, but he won't stop saying that he is the son of God. He won't stop proclaiming that he is the fulfillment of that promise. And it drove the Pharisees crazy. It drove them up the wall because they look at Jesus and he's like, oh, this ugly guy who doesn't do anything. All he does is some miracles. He's not some big military leader. I want to see our people, Israel, conquer the world through this guy. But he never did because he's not who they think he is. They expected Jesus to be an earthly king. And that is what frustrated them. And they wanted to ask this question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Because they expected that there would be two answers. If Jesus said it was lawful, if he said, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, many of the Pharisees at the time considered that an act of idolatry. You're denying your faith in the Lord if you pay taxes to Caesar. But on the other hand, if Jesus said, no, it's not lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, paid in the temple, then they would say, oh, he's acting treasonous against the Roman Empire. So they thought that they totally had him in this catch-22 situation where he could only answer wrongly. But Jesus saw right through their question. I think a lot of emphasis is put on Jesus' answer to this question. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And not enough time is spent looking at how convoluted and messed up that question is. Because it's not even a question. It's not even something that is deserving of an answer. Because all they wanted was to expose Jesus for what they thought he was. A fraud. They just thought Jesus was not who he says he is. But Jesus is a king, but he's a different kind of king. And I think Matthew's ordering of this text is so perfect in chapter 22, because right before his interaction with the Pharisees, Jesus tells a parable. And I think that's such a great way of introducing the Pharisees because a parable is crucially important to the Christian faith. What they do And the purpose of a parable is to take this idea that is a heavenly idea that only Jesus can grasp and then take it down and put it into terms that we can understand by using characters that we can relate to, like a son or a sheep that ran away or a coin that got lost. It's taking that heavenly idea and making it understandable to us. But every time Jesus begins a parable, he begins it with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven 
is like a king and his son, a sheep, a coin, whatever. But he's comparing it to the kingdom of heaven because he is a king. Jesus is a king. He is the king that God promised, but they don't know that. The Pharisees failed to realize that Jesus' kingdom is something very different from what they thought it was going to be. The reason they wanted to ask if it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar was because they wanted to see if Jesus was going to save the Israelites or the Gentiles. But they failed to realize that Jesus was going to save the Jews, the Gentiles, and everybody else. Jesus' love and his grace through his death and his resurrection is not something that can be put in the box like the Pharisees were trying to do. You can't put it in a box. And Jesus' love doesn't just extend to people who are in Rome or Assyria. It extends today. Jesus' love through his death and resurrection is not just for people who do not struggle with addiction. It is not just for people who sing hymns every Sunday, who open the Lutheran service book. It's for people who listen to Hillsong every Sunday. And it's for people who don't just say that, oh, I'll only listen to contemporary music. It's not just for Democrats. It's not just for Republicans. It's not just for liberals, conservatives, or libertarians, or moderates. It's for everybody. His kingdom is different because it doesn't have borders. His love is for everyone. And the Pharisees failed to realize it when they asked that question. They failed to realize that you cannot put a box over Jesus' love. So what are we to make of his answer, though? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. This verse is actually a verse commonly used in reference to a doctrine that Laura perfectly explained in her children's message, which is the doctrine of two kingdoms. And the two kingdoms doctrine is kind of described like this. There's the kingdom on the left and the kingdom on the right. And it's nothing political, it's just to do with God's hands. And it is in reference to how God deals with and interacts with humanity. The kingdom on the left is the kingdom of civil governments and our earthly affairs and God's vocations for us. And it has to do with our citizenship to the United States and how Paul said in Romans 13, we are a part of a government that is ordained by God. And this is the reason we follow these laws. And it's the reason that Christians don't protest things like prison, even though we teach the forgiveness of sins, because we follow the laws of our government ordained by God. And this kingdom, the kingdom of the left, is occupied by Christians and non-Christians alike. The kingdom on the right is the kingdom of heaven. That is Christ's kingdom that is occupied by those who are in Christ. And that is the kingdom of law and gospel, the forgiveness of sins through Jesus' death and resurrection. And as members of these two kingdoms, we kind of have this dual citizenship where we may be a member of this one government, but that doesn't distinguish us in the kingdom of the right. Because in the kingdom of the right, we are all forgiven and loved children of God. The love of Jesus is something that is hard to humanly grasp. It is nothing pertaining to borders and boundaries or beliefs or anything that we consider an earthly distinction. It is truly a love that you can never put a box over. In the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen.